This is the first of two videos in which I'll show you how to customize the Puma microscope. To do this, I'll use a specific example where I modify the monocular tube and ocular attachments to make them compatible with a 1.25 inch astronomical eyepiece, the Celestron XL LX 18mm eyepiece. This example will serve as a guide on how to go about customizing the microscope for any purpose, because I go through the process of defining the goals and editing the FreeCAD models in detail. So, even if this particular mod is of no interest to you, these videos as a whole may be useful anyway. In this first video, I concentrate on how to make the design changes. The next video will concentrate on the actual 3D printing and use of the new models. The first step in any mod is to define what parts need changing and if new parts need to be added. For this example, we need to fit an eyepiece with a wider diameter sleeve into the monocular head of the scope, so the diameter of the parts that accept the eyepiece sleeve must all be widened. Specifically, these are the monocular tube, the 15mm extension, the ocular cap, and the ocular lock nut. However, the 15mm extension is designed to make all the various ocular configurations of Puma easily interchangeable. But, in this case, we only want to use the monocular config, so we can omit the extension and modify the new monocular tube to compensate for that. Note that the threading on the extension that accepts the ocular cap and lock nut is longer than on the original monocular tube, so, since we're not going to use an extension in this mod, we need to extend the amount of threading on our modified monocular tube to make up for this. Finally, we need to alter the length of the monocular tube, partly to compensate for the loss of the 15mm extension, but also to ensure the focal plane of the new eyepiece is placed at the correct level to catch the objective image at its optimal point. Now we know what parts we'll be modifying, we need to specify the exact modifications to make the changes to the CAD models. Most obviously, the diameter of the parts must be enlarged to accept the 1.25 inch diameter sleeve. I work in millimeters, so 1.25 inches is 31.75 millimeters. Currently, the Puma scope parts accept 23.2 millimeter eyepieces and have an internal diameter of 23.4 millimeters for the ocular cap and 23.6 millimeters for the monocular tube. The extra 0.2 and 0.4 mm of diameter in these parts over the 23.2 mm of the IP sleeve ensures a good fit even with the tolerances of low-cost FDM printing. In FreeCAD we use radii instead of diameter, and I measure only to two decimal places of a millimeter. So, by adding these 0.2 and 0.4 mm of extra diameter space, to the 31.75 mm diameter of the new IP sleeve, halving to get radius measurements and rounding to two decimal places, we get the new inner radii of 15.98 mm for the ocular cap and 16.08 mm for the monocular tube. In both cases, we'll be increasing the radius from the original design by 4.28 mm. In order to keep wall thicknesses the same, will increase the radius of all parts of the models by 4.28 mm, not just the internal radii. Clearly, we don't want to change the bottom end of the monocular tube because that thread articulates with the filter block, and that part is not changing. So we'll need to fashion a transition of some kind, from the original dimensions at the bottom to the new wider dimensions at the top. The various astronomical eyepieces I have in my collection have a sleeve length of up to 30 mm. But these can also take filters that extend the length. So, to ensure there'll be enough room for general use, I plan to make the increased tube radii extend for at least 5 cm down the monocular tube before transitioning to the original diameter for articulation with the filter block. Regarding the length of threading at the top of the monocular tube, the length of threading on the standard 15 mm extension module is 13 mm but the length on the standard monocular tube is only 8 mm, so we'll need to elongate that by 5 mm to allow the same amount of adjustment room that the 15 mm spacer would have provided. 
In order to decide the new length of the monocular tube itself, we first need to know the position of the focal plane of the new eyepiece. Unlike microscope eyepieces that have a well-established standard position for their focal plane across manufacturers, being 10 mm below the shoulder or flange of the eyepiece, astronomical eyepieces have no such common standard. Not only does the level of the focal plane vary from one manufacturer to another, but even the same manufacturer will make eyepieces that have the focal plane in different places from one product to the next. Some manufacturers, like Celestron, will make a particular range of eyepieces, like the XLLX series, that are all parfocal with each other, but they will not be parfocal with other series from the same manufacturer. To make matters worse, they don't even specify in their product specs where the focal plane is in terms of millimeters below the shoulder of the eyepiece, and in some eyepieces the focal plane is not below the shoulder at all, but above it. For astronomical telescope use, this variation and lack of information about the focal plane doesn't really matter, because the object is at infinity, and so can only be brought to a focus by the objective at one point. You can't change where the focus point is for any given objective, because you can't significantly change the distance from the objective to the object. Thus, for a telescope, all focusing is done by moving the eyepiece till the focal plane of the eyepiece coincides with the fixed focal plane of the objective. As long as you have an eyepiece focuser tube with enough travel distance to cover all the various levels of focal planes that various astronomical eyepieces may have, all is well. However, for modern microscopes the situation is different. In a microscope, the eyepiece is placed at a constant fixed optical distance from the objective by means of a fixed length of tubing on which the eyepiece rests, and focusing is done by changing the distance between the object and the objective. Microscope objectives can make a focused image of the object appear at a wide range of positions by simply moving the object closer to or further from the objective lens. However, the image will be optimally corrected for aberrations only at one of those points, which is the optical path length of the objective, which by RMS standard is 150 mm from the flange of the objective, or at infinity for infinity corrected objectives. So, for the best quality image, we need to ensure that the eyepiece focal plane is placed exactly at 150 mm from the flange of the objective, and, to do that, we need to know where the eyepiece focal plane is in relation to the flange of the eyepiece so we can make the fixed tube on which the eyepiece rests the correct length. Because Celestron doesn't tell us the position of the focal plane, we need to figure out some way to measure that for ourselves. One way to find the focal plane of an eyepiece is to look through it with your eye relaxed and looking into the far distance, or use a camera focused at infinity and then bring some solid object up to the other end of the eyepiece. The point at which the object comes into sharp focus is the focal plane of the eyepiece. Unfortunately, we can't use that method for the XL eyepiece because it has glass lens elements placed in the sleeve beyond its focal plane. So we can't move a solid object through that glass to get it close enough to reach the focal plane, assuming the focal plane is not further out beyond the end of the sleeve. However, while solid objects can't pass through glass, Photonic objects can, so all we need now is a photonic object generator. Then we can essentially use the same method as before, using a photonic object instead of a solid one. Fortunately, the Puma microscope itself can act as a photonic object generator. So, I'll now demonstrate how to use Puma to find the focal plane of the Celestron eyepiece. For this experiment, we'll start off with the Puma microscope with its monocular head and a standard microscope eyepiece. 
using either an eyepiece camera focused at infinity or your eye relaxed and looking into the distance, focus the scope as usual on a specimen. Set up a ruler so we can measure the distance from the focus platform upwards. We know that the level of the focus platform is the same as the level of the flange of the objective, so the optimal focal plane of an RMS standard objective will be 150mm above the level of the top of the focus platform. Next, we remove the monocular tube without altering the focus of the scope, and we swing the Celestron eyepiece into position above the filter block. We then move it up and down along the optical axis until the image seen looking down the Celestron eyepiece is also in sharp focus. At this point, we know that the image from the objective coincides with the focal plane of the Celestron eyepiece. But we also know that the level of the objective image is 150 millimeters from the top of the focus platform. Therefore, we can identify the position of the focal plane of the eyepiece, which in this case is about 2 millimeters above the level of the flange of the eyepiece. Now, this method does not take into account the extra optical path length caused by the glass elements in the sleeve of the eyepiece. So, this is the effective level of the focal plane, rather than the physical level inside the eyepiece. But we don't need to know that physical level unless we want to take the eyepiece apart and put a graticule or some other physical object at the focal plane. And we're not going to do that here. So, now we have the final piece of information we need to customize the monocular tube for use with this eyepiece. The flange of the eyepiece will rest on the ocular cap, and the ocular cap will screw onto the monocular tube. Accounting for a default ocular cap gap of 2 mm, this means that there will be 5 mm from the flange of the eyepiece to the top of the monocular tube. We can now add the 2 mm above the ocular cap where the effective focal plane of the Celestron eyepiece is located. This means there is a total of 7 mm from the top of the new monocular tube to the focal plane of the eyepiece, which must be 150 mm in total above the flange of the objective. We know from the Puma specs that there is 61 mm from the objective flange to the top of the filter block, leaving a further 89 mm to make up the required 150 mm. Thus, the part of the new monocular tube above the filter block must be 89 minus 7 equals 82 millimeters. The original monocular tube is 79 millimeters long, so this means we must lengthen the new monocular tube by 3 millimeters compared to the original. Now I'll show you how to make these edits to the FreeCAD models. Now before I show you the editing of the complex models themselves, I thought it would be helpful to give you a very basic introduction into how I make models with FreeCAD in general. So this is the FreeCAD startup screen, version 0.20.1 in Linux. And we'll start by creating a new file. You can either click here or up here. Now you can do many things in FreeCAD, and for each job it requires a set of tools. In FreeCAD, tool sets are called workbenches, and you select which one you want from this drop-down list here. I'm going to be making a simple lens cap type model from basic parts. So I'm going to select the part workbench. It gives us a, select, a set of primitive parts we can begin with and ways to combine them and edit them. So I'm going to start with a cylinder. Click here. Uh, this I don't want this particular set of dimensions, but that's okay. We can change that. So click on the cylinder and now it gives us the things we can edit. So I'm going to increase the diameter to 15 millimeters. Use the scroll wheel on my mouse to zoom out. And I'll call this, uh, so select it, F2 to change the name, and I'll call it Cap Solid. Now I want to subtract something from this solid uh, cylinder to make it into a cap. So another cylinder. So instead of, I could select another cylinder from here, but this one has roughly the right dimensions I want already. So I'll just copy this, Control C, and then select the background, then Control V. And now I'll change the name of this one, F2, to Cap cuts. Now I need to shrink the dimension a little bit before I cut it away from the solid, otherwise they're equal uh, cylinders, so it would be nothing left if I just did a cut like this. So we'll reduce the um, radius by one millimeter. Now if we cut this away from solid, we'll just get a ring. So to, to make it a proper cap, we need one surface to be solid. So I will go to placement, position, and I'll increase the position in Z by one millimeter. There we are. So now we can 
cut this cuts part away from the solid part and we'll end up with something that looks like a cap. So select the solid part first, then with the uh, control button down, you select the thing you want to cut away from the solid part, and then you select this button here called cut, and it does the job for you. So now your base, this is your basic lens cap, but it has sharp edges. So I will call this cap sharp, and then I will smooth the edges. So it's selected, I will now select the a chamfer tool and we'll select the edges with a mouse so this edge this edge and this edge and we'll make a chamfer of 0 0.25 millimeters say okay so this is our final product now we'll change the name again f2 cap now you'll notice if you open up this tree on the side here all the steps that we did have been recorded in a tree-like notation you can actually edit the individual parts of this without undoing everything, provided it doesn't break the model. If it's going to break the model, then you'll need to undo the steps and then do the edit and then redo the steps that you've undone. So an example of something that won't break the model is if I increase the thickness of the wall. So if I use the cap solid, select that, I'll increase the radius to 16 millimeters. Now, you won't see anything at this stage uh, until we recompute the model. So if I go back to the top, select it, right click, and do recompute object, the model is recomputed with a thicker wall. So that's a basic example of how to build something with FreeCAD. Now just a, a few words about the graphical interface here. There are different ways of manipulating 3D models on the screen. And you select the way you want by right clicking on the background and go to something called navigation styles. And then you can select the one you like. I like this gesture method but you may be used to some of these other ones. So you can select whichever one you like. And another thing is visibility. So we have a model, we can make it visible and invisible by clicking the space bar. So, okay, click the space bar to make things visible and invisible. Just because something is invisible, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And I've had people emailing me with regards to the Puma models and say, oh, all the models are grayed out. You know, what's going on? It's just because they're invisible like that. See, that's grayed out. If we make some more models, there's a sphere, and we can gray that one out. There's a ready-made tube. Gray that one out. So they're all grayed out, but they all exist. So here's the cap. I made it visible with the space bar. Here's the sphere. Again, made it visible with the space bar. And here's the tube. They all exist. But it's confusing to have lots of models visible all the time. So it's useful to only let one show at any one time. And that's what I do with my Puma microscope models. There are many, many, many models, but only one of them is visible when you open up the file. Uh, just use the space bar to toggle things visible and invisible. So hopefully this will make the following demonstrations more intelligible. Now we've opened the FreeCAD file of the monocular parts in FreeCAD, and we want to edit this model here, Ocular Cap. Notice it's grayed out, you can't see it. What you're seeing is the C-mount extension. We can make that invisible by selecting it and click the spacebar. Then we'll select the ocular cap and press the spacebar, make it visible. And we're not going to make the changes in the original file. We're going to make a new document by clicking this button here. And we'll make the changes in a copy. So we'll go back to the monocular, we'll select the ocular cap, we'll do Control C to make a copy, say OK. And then we'll go to our unnamed new file, and we'll do a control V to bring it into the new file. So here's a copy we're going to edit. This is what it looks like on the microscope. You were seeing it upside down before, because that's the way I print it. And we're going to change this model, but the edits that we're going to make will mess up the order of the edges. And so these chamfered edges will no longer be chamfered if we make everything in situ. The edges, those chamfers will exist, but they'll exist in other edges we don't want chamfered. So first, we must delete the chamfer operation. But before we delete it, we will see what edges need to be chamfered and by how much, so we can reapply that later at the end. So double click on the chamfer operation. And if we double click on or click or double click on any of these edges that we see highlighted in green, those are the ones that are chamfered. We'll see just how much they are chamfered by. So if I click on that one, you'll see it's half a millimeter at the top. And this inner one, also half a millimeter. There we are, chamfer. And the bottom one 
Well, that's chamfered by one millimeter. Now you can write that down if you want. I'll remember it, so I'm not going to do that. You say OK for now. Then we will select the chamfer operation up here and we'll press the delete button on the keyboard. So that gets rid of the chamfer. Now we can make the changes to the diameters. We're going to add 4.28 to all diameters. And I've made a list here of all the diameters that we're going to change and what we're changing them from and what we're changing them to. And these are the various parts of the model. So I just made that to make it easier for me to demonstrate this to you. So we'll start off with the outermost parts of the model, make those bigger first, because if we make the inner holes bigger, they'll overshoot the solid parts and we'll break the model. So let's open up the model here as I'm doing. And we see we have the cap wall. If we click spacebar on that, we'll superimpose it, and you'll see that's the solid cylinder that forms the outer cap wall. So we definitely want to increase that first. So let's get rid of the visibility of the whole model. We'll just keep the visibility of the cap wall. Left click the cap wall model to select it, and we can change the radius down here. Now we're changing it, it says here, from 17.5 to 21.78, because that's what you get when you add. 4.28 to 17.5. So we'll do that now. 21.78. So we've made that bigger. Now we can make the cuts bigger. So the cuts here are labeled as lumen and they are made of two parts, the top part and the thread part. So if we open that out, we'll see, select each one individually cap thread. There we are. And this is a composite because what we have is a solid cylinder with a helical thread cut into the solid cylinder. So we'll need to increase each of those separately. So this is the solid cylinder. But first we'll increase the size of this thread cutting shape here. And to do that there are two parts to this. One is the helix. The helix just gives us the angle, the pitch angle of the thread. It doesn't affect the diameter of the thread, so we're not going to change that. What we will change is the sketch. So if we double click on the sketch, we'll open up the sketch editor, and what we want to do is increase the distance of this uh, thread cutting shape from the center point. Now we don't have a you know, distance to change at the moment, we need to have a constraint that constrains the distance to a specific amount and then change it, but I didn't make it that way originally. So we'll need to add that constraint. Uh, first, we'll get rid of this redundant constraint, it says here. So click on it. This is the one that's redundant. We'll do a right click with the mouse. We'll do delete. Now we have one degree of freedom. We'll use that to make our constraint. So we'll click on the central axis here to highlight it. We'll click on one of these points to highlight it. And now we want to make a distance constraint between that point and the central axis. So we go to our constraints. We'll choose this uh, distance, and you see it's 14.25. We want to change that to 18.53 to make it the correct amount bigger. So 18.53. So we've made our thread, enlarged it to the correct amount. So our thread cutting part has been enlarged, but the cylinder is still small. So we select this cylinder, a cylinder 585, and as I said here, we're going from a radius of 15.2 to 19.48. So 19.48. So now they're both enlarged appropriately. We can make them invisible with our spacebar, and we'll see what it looks like altogether. So there we have the enlarged thread with the same pitch angle. Now. We can close that. We've got the cap top now we need to enlarge. So we've selected it. We want to change the cap top from 11.7 .7 to 15.98. So let's do that. 15.98. So now it's appropriately enlarged. And there's one more thing that we need to make bigger, which is the cone that I use to cut into the thread to make it easier to thread on and off the tube. So we need to change the two radii of the cone the smaller and the larger. We'll change the larger one first from 15.2 to 19.48. 19.48. There we are. And then the smaller one will go to 18.48. One millimeter smaller. 18.48. So now we've made the cone appropriately larger. We can spacebar that to make it 
invisible. And then our overall shape now should be correct. There it is. If for any reason you don't see that, you can just right click on the shape and do recompute object. And that will make sure everything is applied. But we didn't need to in this case. So now all we need to do is re add our chamfer. So we'll go to the parts workbench. We've selected the object. We now select the chamfering tool. And then we will chamfer those edges as we saw before. So the bottom edge is one millimeter, and there it is. The top two edges have to be 0 0.5. So select the edge. Can you? I keep missing the edge. That's why you hear that little beep. There we go, we've got it. Uh, 0 0.5. Let's do that. 0 0.5. And then inner one also 0 0.5. So we'll change it from 1 to 0 0.5. Okay. And there we are. So the shape is now correct, but the name is generic. So let's give it the proper name that we want. So we can copy and paste name. So I've selected that sharp name there. I'll do F2 to allow me to edit it. I'll do Control C to copy. Go to the chamfer. F2, Control V to paste. Get rid of the sharp. And rather than just call it ocular cap, because it could be confused with the original one, I will now make it ocular cap Excel. LX, because that's what we made it for. Now the model is done. We need to make the mesh for printing, because that's how I do my printing with STL meshes. So select the model. Let's make sure it's the correct orientation. So I'll click on this button here, which gives us the orientation. That shows that when I export it, it'll be like this. So the bottom part will be on the print bed, which is what I want. Well, it's the top part of the model, but I want that to be on the print bed, so it's upside down. Now we'll go to the mesh design workbench. And while it's still selected, go to meshes, create mesh from shape. And I use these standard uh, settings for my meshes. Say OK. And after a while, you get your mesh. Now, the mesh is shown here superimposed on the original model. We don't want to see the original model at this stage, so I'll just press the space bar to get rid of the visibility of the original model. Click on the actual mesh itself, right click, and we can say export mesh. I don't want this brackety thing on the file name, so I'll get rid of it. I will just, I'm going to save it as an STL, binary STL, but you have a whole range of things here. You can save it as if you're into those other things for whatever reason. But I'll use binary STL for printing. I'll say save. And that's that. Now we'll customize the ocular lock nut in the same way. So do control C. OK to copy, make a new document. Control V to paste. And there it is. Now before we start, we'll get rid of the chamfer which had this 0 0.5 millimeter chamfer on both sides so select the chamfer then press delete and then we'll also get rid of this fillet which is a three millimeter fillet on all these sharp edges so again we select it and press delete now if you open up this structure you'll find it's made of two basic things a round nut and a neural cut the neural cut is made of these cylinders but we'll concentrate on the round nut to begin with and the basic shape is this cap wall cylinder which we're going to increase from a, a radius of 20 to 24.28 so there's we're adding 4.28 remember to all radii and listen out for when i press the space bar to make things visible and invisible because i won't say that out loud all the time now we'll deal with a thread and we'll do this is very similar to what we had before so first we'll start with the sketch double click uh, we'll get rid of this redundant constraint, right click, delete. Now we'll make a new constraint, select the central bar, scroll in with the mouse, select one of these points, get your distance constraint, there it is. Change it from 14.25 to 18.53. There we are. Close, so that's that done. And then we have a solid part to this, which is the inner cylinder. And we're going to increase that radius from 15.2 to 19. 0.48 and before we finish with the uh, threaded part we're going to change the bevel which is the cone the larger radius is going to expand from 15.2 to 
to 19.48 and the smaller radius is one millimeter smaller so it's 18.48 so that's dealt with the basic nut shape and if we collapse everything back oh i left it visible so just spacebar collapse everything back there we are and just in case anything wasn't updated you can do a recompute object but everything was fine there so now we'll go to the neural cut and this is made of two sets of cylinders which are rotated relative to one another they're essentially copies of each other and that means we can actually edit two cylinders at once so to select both cylinders we do a control and select and so these cylinders the we're going to change the y position because we don't changing the radius we're not changing the radii of these we're changing their position from the center of the uh, plan so we'll go to placement position the y value we're changing here from 27.5 to 31.78 now we'll go to the next pair 603 605 and we'll change their y value from minus 27.5 to minus 31.78 and then we'll go to the next pair where we'll change the x position for these two from minus 27.5 to minus 31.78 control copy control paste uh, control c control v rather and then finally these two where we'll also change the x this time in the positive from 27.5 to 31.78 so that's all done so now we've fixed the knurl and the sil and the basic nut so everything is in the correct proportions let's go now to the cut which we didn't undo so it should still be there now let's make sure this all been applied recompute object as yes, it has so this is now the bigger version now we can reapply the smoothing of the edges the first thing that we did we need to do rather is change smooth these parts with our fillet remember this was three millimeters fillet so i'm just going to select all the edges it can be a bit fiddly you can always zoom in to help if you keep missing edges like i do that one that one and once we have selected them all we'll make sure they're all selected and then we'll change the default value of the fillet from one to three. So have I missed any? Yes, I have here a couple. So now all those edges, so I seem to have got them all now. So now we'll change this from one to three. You can see it's applied it to everything. I say, okay. Okay, that's all smoothed out. We'll change the name. F2, Control C, F2, Control V. Get rid of, oops, get rid of one of the sharps. I missed that. That's why I added a 001 on to it for me. Now on this we'll add the final chamfer, which was remember 0 0.5, and you only need to do this for two of the edges. Put in the 0 0.5 here, and it will change it on all the applied edges. And then that propagates all the way around. So now that's done. We'll change the name. And this time we're not going to leave it as lock nut. We'll now call it Excel LX. And that's done. Now all that's left to do is turn it into a mesh, export it as STL, and print it. So you've seen this on the previous one. What I want to make sure on this one, and we'll do that in a second, so get rid of that. So this is the part with the cone added to it, and this is the part that didn't have the cone added to it. And we can tell that if we just uh, show the model, you see it has this longer diagonal line, so that indicates where I cut the cone out, and I want that part to be on the print bed, because it will give us more leeway to deal with any elephant footing. So let's see if that's correct and actually no it's not correct so that part with the big diagonal is on the top and i don't want that so what i'll do i'll need to in flip the model i'll do that with the 
actual mesh this time. So right click, transform, 180 degrees. There we are. So that's the correct orientation that I wanted on the print bed with the larger cone cut part on the print bed. So now we can export that. Right click on the mesh. We say export mesh. Get rid of the brackety bit. I'm exporting it as a binary STL. And that's that. So now we'll edit the monocular tube itself. And these are our four goals that we need to achieve. So we select the tube, Control C to copy, say OK. New document, Control V. We'll separate out the tube from its adhesin. We'll come back to the adhesin later. This uh, chamfer on the bottom, 0.5 millimeter chamfer, it's not going to survive all the changes we're doing, so we'll have to add it back at the end. So select, delete. And let's open up the tube into its uh, baffles part and the part without baffles. We'll come back to the baffles later. Select the other part, delete to separate out in the solid, and cuts. Come back to the cuts later. So, solid, press delete again. Into its component parts now, we have the thread and basic tube. In the microscope, it's like this. The thread, it goes to the filter block, and this is the basic monocular tube. Now we're going to split this up because we're going to make an expanded portion, a transitional portion, and an unaltered portion. So if we open up this chamfer, the basic cylinder is in here. Let's make a copy of it because we'll use the copy. Control C, Control V. We'll use this copy to make the expanded top part of the tube later. First, let's concentrate on the unaltered part. So that's this part here. We're going to shrink this down to from its original 79 millimeters, which was the total length of the tube. Now it's only going to be a short portion that's going to be left unaltered. So we're going to make this 20 millimeters. But you see it shrunk it in the wrong direction for us now. So we'll go to Placement and Position, and we need to change the Z offset to put it back where it needs to be, from minus 45 to plus 14. OK, so we've done the unaltered portion. And that's dealt with. Now we need a transition. So we'll go to our part workbench. We're here already. And we'll select a cone that we're going to use to make a transition. So let's call this F2 Trans Solid. And let's change its radii. So the new expanded radius is going to be this one, 19.18. So radius 1, 19.18. And the original radius, 14.9. So that'll be the other end, radius 2, 14.9. And it's offset here, so we need to change the Z offset. There we are. So now we've got our unaltered part, we've got our transition part. Now we need to do the expanded part that accepts the new eyepiece. So let's, let's use the copy that we've made there. Let's do F2. We'll change this name to Tube Top Solid. And we'll change its radius, 19.18, the new expanded radius. But we also need to change the length because we're not the top part here or the part near the filter block is being dealt with. So this is only the part that's going to be near the eyepiece. So we're going to change it to a number that when you add it to the other parts will make a total of 82. Now we've got 20 millimeters for the unaltered part. We've got 10 millimeters for the transition, so that's 30 millimeters. So you need to add another 52 millimeters. So that's what the length is going to be 52 millimeters but you see it's partly overlapping here so again we need to offset it in Z one two three so that's that is what makes the new tube three millimeters longer than the original one now before we put this all back together again as the new solid component let's make copies of this tube top solid control C control V and the transition control C control V because it's easier for us to do it this way than to do it later when we're making the internal components. We'll use these copies as the internal components for those new parts. So change the name of the tube top solid copy to tube top lumen and change the name of trans solid copy to trans lumen. And now we need to change the diameters to make them smaller because these are going to be the internal counterparts. So Translumen radius 1, 16.08, and radius 2, 11.8. Control C, select Control V. And as for the tube, that will be 16.08. Control C, 
control v so these are now ready to use for our internal parts we can leave them for now and just take all our solid parts and put them back together so select with your finger on the control button of the keyboard so select multiple things now we come to our operations here we select the union operation that will give us a fusion of those parts and we will change the name to monocular tube solid So this is our new version of monocular tube solid. Now we can turn our attention to the cuts. So the cuts are here. Press delete. That will split them up. Now notice that well, the cuts are of two parts. There's the parts that deal with the thread and there's the lumen. I'm going to open up this lumen into separate parts. So I select it. But first you should notice that it has a minus 15 offset. When I do the delete operation on this, that will also delete this minus 15 offset. So we need to add this minus 15 offset to the component parts as we edit them. So select, delete. So you see it's moved up when we did the delete. So let's start operating on these parts. So optical aperture 002. That's this little bit here. We just need to shift this by minus 15 in Z. So placement, position. So it goes from 47 to 32. Okay, that's that dealt with. Uh, now we'll do the, the chamfer part, this bit here. Now remember this, well, this is the counterpart of the unchanged part that we dealt with. So we have to, again, reduce the size of this to what it was on the solid component. So if I make that invisible, make this visible, the cylinder, we're going to change the height to 20 and we'll need to shift the Z because of that offset. So we're going to go from minus 30 to 12. So that puts it in the correct position. So this is the unchanged part, the internal lumen of the unchanged part. And we've already made the luminal parts for the uh, transition and the new expanded bit. So now we can recombine them all. So we'll take the chamfer, finger on the control key here, the uh, trans lumen, and the tube top lumen, and the optical aperture 002. And now we'll combine them with a union operation. And we'll rename the fusion monocular tube lumen. I'll just copy this to save me typing it out. So control C, F2, there we go. So now we've dealt with the lumen, we need to deal with the thread parts. So let's just get that out of the way. The thread parts include the actual thread itself and a snuff cap. So we'll reposition the ocular snuff cap, select it, and we'll move it down by three millimeters. One, two, three. That gives us the extra, compensates for the extra height of the new tube. And we'll deal with the ocular thread. Now, we can do the same for the ocular thread. Move it down by three. One, two, three. Okay, now we need to do some other things for the thread and for the snuff cap. We need to increase the diameter. And we also need to increase the length of threading. So let's open up the thread. This is the sweep of thread. And this is a cropping cylinder. So a very easy way to increase the amount of threading is to simply lift this cropping cylinder up in Z. So we're going to move from 52 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we may increase this by 5 millimeters, the amount of threading. So that's dealt with that. Now we're going to deal with the diameters. So if we go into... Um, the sweep. Now we can deal with the sketch very similar to how we did it with the, the other thread. So if we double click on the sketch, we go into the sketch editor. And this time we do have a constraint ready made for us, so it's easier. We just need to change the value of this constraint from 15 to 19.28. Control C, click on double click on that. Control V, and that's all done. 
And we want to make sure that the cropping cylinder also, you see now the cropping cylinder is smaller than the actual thread, so it won't do the crop. So we need to increase the uh, radius on the cropping cylinder as well. So we'll make that the new radius 22.28. Control C, Control V. There we are. So we've dealt with the, I'll just do a recompute object just to make sure everything, there we are. So we've dealt with the thread. Now we need to deal with the radii on the snuff cap because that's too small. So we'll open it up and we've got a cylinder and a cone. So on the cylinder, we're going to change the radius from 16 to 20.28. So there's the cylinder, 16, 20.28. And on the cone, we'll change the radii Radius 1 from 5 to 9.28, control C, control V, and radius 2 from 15 to 19.28, control C, control V. Uh, it looks like it's done, but I'll just do a recompute object just to make sure everything's okay. So, now that's dealt with, we've got the ocular thread, the ocular snuff cap. Uh, we can make a union. So, we're going to do the ocular thread, the ocular snuff cap, the monocular tube lumen, the new lumen we made, and the opercule, all selected with control key pressed down. And we'll go to our union operation to make them all into one. And now, F2. Well, let's just copy this, it's easier. Monocular tube cuts, we'll change the name of the fusion to monocular tube cuts. So F2, control V. And now we can actually make the cut. So we've got to select the solid part first, then with the control key down, select the thing you're going to cut away from it. Then you select your cut operation. That gives us the new tube without the baffles in it. Okay, so we'll call it that. Monocular tube, no baffles. Control C, Control V. Now, we can't just add the baffles as they were originally because you see some of them are inside this expanded part. So we need to delete those. We're not going to use those because we need all this expanded part for possible filters in the sleeve of the new eyepiece. So let's just make this invisible. So we want to delete this baffle and that baffle. These baffles don't need to change otherwise because they're the right, di the right radius, the right diameter. They're in the unchanged part. So to delete them, we need to open this out. But notice if we come down here, we need to keep an eye on the Z position if there's any offsets that we need to reapply. So if we go to the select the baffles, because I was selecting the monocular tube just then, we'll go back. Yes, yes, we see there's a minus 15 that we'll need to apply once we've deleted these baffles. So let's open it up, select, press delete. So that splits them all up. You notice that they've all moved up a bit because the offset is now gone. So we want to delete this and this. Now we can't just select it and press delete button because all that will do is open it out into the next level as we were doing before. So the way to delete something completely, the quick way, is to go to the open SCAD workbench and you see there's a tool here called remove object and their children. So if you just select, select the thing you want to remove, click this button and it removes it completely. So select, click, removes completely. So let's go back to our part workbench. Let's take the remaining baffles with a control key held down and we will make a union of them and we can call the new fusion the baffles f2 and don't forget we need to redo our offset of minus 15 here minus 15 now we can combine the baffles with the tube without baffles. So with the control key held down, we select both. We do a union. There it is. And we can call this monocular tube sharp. Control C, F2, Control V. Now remember we had that 0 0.5 millimeter chamfer that we undid. So select this, go to chamfer, Select the edge, make it 0 0.5 millimeters. Say OK. And that is now our new 
fully done monocular tube so we need to change this generic name uh, let me go inside copy this name f2 control c f2 control v but instead of just leaving it as monocular tube we're going to call it monocular tube xl lx now we need to deal with the adhesin because you see it's in the wrong place and the gap is in, is too small so we've increased the length of this tube by three millimeters that was our design aim so let us also move this down in z by three one two three and there we are it fits perfectly on the bottom but we still need to deal with this gap because it's the radius is too small so we can do that in situ there's no need to take this apart so if we go to the pads cut 396 and we'll increase cylinder 683 as shown here from 14.25 to 18.53 control copy control paste cylinder 705 will increase the radius of that from 11.5 to 15.78 control c control v and you see it's marked as ready for recomputation so let's recompute it i'll show you what happens when we do that so right click recompute object there we are so now the gap is in the right place so now we can fuse these two together select them both with the control button held down do a fusion okay we'll rename that f2 control c f2 control v and we'll call it with and he's in now let's check the orientation that's the way i want it on the print bed the print bed is down here so this is all fine we can do the mesh operation now and um, save it as an stl file ready to go into our slicer program so that we can then put the resulting g code into our printer and print it I hope this video has given you a practical level of knowledge of how the Puma microscope can be modified to suit your own custom needs, using this 1.25 inch eyepiece mod merely as an example. In part 2 of this video, I'll discuss the 3D printing, assembling and use of this mod, and show some sample images using the Optark AF51 eyepiece camera. Together, these two videos should give you all you need to know to make any custom modification of the Puma microscope design. Please remember to like, comment and share this video to support the Puma Open Source Microscopy project. Thanks for watching.